Welcome back. At this time, we have Mr. Loge, Engineering Works and Utility Director, with the proposed 2022 Engineering Works and Utility General and Capital Budgets. Welcome, Mr. Loge. So I'll try to keep it uh, try to keep it brief for you all. So um, the, uh, the my presentation this morning will cover the engineering and works and the general capital budgets, the utility side of the budget. Um, I'll have a little bit of a, of a discussion with regards to the asset management plan. Um, as council may be aware, I'm the asset management champion for the town, um, sitting as a as a as a a liaison to all of the asset management development within the community and, and it's it's a commitment that the town has made that that I personally don't take lightly and I don't think as council members when you adopt the policy it's, it's a signal that you don't take it lightly either um, our asset management uh, strategic documents are on our website for the public to see at, at large we're in that first phase of it and we're, we're taking the next steps to develop concrete and, and, uh, and definitive steps to support the strategic plan initiatives that council has adopted in the last year so, so when, when the Director of Community Services talks about our asset management plan, um, it's with the understanding that we are at the, 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 the baby steps of, of this asset management plan and, and everything this, that we do and every decision that we make is key to the longevity, the sustainability and the affordability of our community. And that all links back to the level of service that we want to deliver to our residents. Um, it's a key component of our growth. Um, and even though we are just at the baby steps of, of our asset management plan, um, I'm, I'm proud to say that as a community, we're actually one of the leaders in the province of New Brunswick for the level of, of, of completeness of our asset management plan. Most communities just com completed a bare bones uh, strategic statement that they would qu then qualify for uh, funding, federal and provincial funding. We took it to that next level and decided to make sure it was an active living and, and evolving document. And, we do appreciate the council's support as we, we walk through that, uh, that process. That having been said, um, that gives me the overriding uh, uh, context for a lot of the work that you'll see that we undertake with the engineering group. Different from the director of community services, um, the, the role that we find ourselves with the engineering and works group is, is as core, as essential as, as you find of community services, but it's a different flavor. Um, this is a, these are the, the services that most of the time a community has no choice but to offer, whereas community services, it is a, it is a concrete and a definitive choice that you make to offer that next level of service that makes this community the place that people want to be. But from an engineering perspective and a public works perspective, you don't have a community without a street to get to your house. Uh, if you want to meet health standards, you don't have a community if you don't have water and sewer to your home. Um, and everything that branches off of that from, from making sure that the roads are smooth with no potholes to making sure that they're plowed in the wintertime. So, so the context um, is different. They are no less uh, important to each other. They complement each other between community services, works, uh, the, the utility side of things, and it all goes back to the commitment that we as a community make to our residents and the level of service that we want to ma be make, making to them. So... so my budget is in no way a competition to any other budget. It is, it, is a, it, is a, it is a budget that we propose to make sure that you as, as councillors are able to respond to the residents to say, yes, we hear you. Yes, this is what we're going to offer for you. This is what we feel is important. And it warms the cockles of my heart, if we can say that on YouTube, I guess, um, that, to hear the mayor uh, introducing the, the, the new police chief, uh, but with the acknowledgement that that we, we serve as first responders to the community. Um, I, I get joked around a lot because I carry around the public works first responder, but that, that's a credo that um, we have to be able to recognize is that um, we are there in that front lines to make sure that the residents have a safe and comfortable night to spend in their beds when everything goes on around them is going to, to heck in a handbasket. And, and our people are the people in that front lines, whether it's making sure that they have a, a place to build off steam or whether it's a place to get the ability to get to place to build off steam. So um, I appreciate the support, Your Worship, that, that you demonstrated in communicating that to, the, to our, our co compatriots with the collective services. Um, the guns and hoses sometimes get the glory. 
the public works people um, are there beforehand to make sure that they can get that glory. So uh, enough of that uh, stepping stone or, or, or soapbox. The, the public works and engineering budget that we're gonna be talking about, if I can figure out which one it is, There we go. Did you do that? Okay. So I may, I may, I may just point at you then if this thing's dead. Um, so we're about 20% of the uh, overall, the overall uh, municipal general expense. And that represents um, everything from the transportation side of things, the environmental and development services, our protective services, which, which of those we, we've got the building inspection and animal control. So we're talking about a $5.6 million budget. Um, it, it, is, it, it fluctuates the last few years, anywhere from 19.8 to 21%. You know, percent. But again, we're, we hang consistently in that, in that area. Um, we're responsible for all or portions of the budgets as, as they're described in the year. So, so what we'll find is that in, in, in our overviews as we move forward in the, in the next couple of pages in my presentation, we'll break it down in the presentation so that you can see where we fit into each of them. The, uh, does this still go? All right. Pardon? Five point five six eight three. Five five six eight. Oh. Well, uh, that's that's the uh, that's the Treasury Department's accounting. Yeah, and I I need my glasses. So. So when we look at each division, under transportation, you're going to things like um, winter works, summer works, driveway culverts, the engineering group falls into that. Signs, sign, uh, traffic lane marking, street signs, railroad crossings, actually the COMEX comes under that transportation side of the budget. The environmental development services, things like our municipal plan, uh, our planning advisory committee, the plan, municipal planning officer, uh, municipal plans will fall into that group. Protective services, the building inspection, the animal control group will fall under, the, under that uh, side of things. Um, as, I, as I said, each of these divisions are, um, uh, we, we try to take them as a, uh, we address them individually. From a budget perspective, they get lumped in because they happen to fall under this. I can't do this work without uh, identifying that. Um, it's not all my work. I've got uh, managers uh, in, within the departments that administer this for me. They take the policy direction that council has presented, the decisions that we make in the budget, and we help make sure that they're followed through on. Uh, Jason McCarthy is our, util our work superintendent. Uh, Mark Morrison is our trans uh, engineering uh, manager. Uh, Trevor uh, Murray is our building inspector. As, as managers, they do the work to help m make me look good, and it's usually not an easy job trying to make me look good, but they do a good job at it, so we'll try to carry forward. So when we look at the budget, we talk about level of service and the considerations that we're trying to try to maintain. So the, the, it's a growing community, and every year we see a little bit of growth happening. And what that means is, with the growth, we have to maintain those those streets that are being being put into place. In 2021, 20, uh, we saw about 1.34 kilometers of new streets being added. So that's development in the town, new subdivisions, new homes, never been in in the community before. So those are added to our length. So a snowplow route or routes have been added, an, an extra kilometer has been added to a snowplow route. Um, 1.34 kilometers, so we're about 185 kilometers total street distances in the town now. Um, last year, for example, we added uh, 1.1, you know, the year before we were uh, about uh, 0.83, so we're adding a little around a, around a kilometer each year. Um, this year, so far to date, we've hit about 79 single family residential units. We've already hit 83 since I put this PowerPoint together in, this, in a matter of a week. And in speaking with our building inspector and in discussions with contractors, we will definitely be, he's predicting we will hit 100 or better by the end of December 31st. 100 new building starts in the town of Chris Pamps is, is, is historical for us in any stretch of the imagination. Last year when we hit 76 building starts in the year, we thought that was something else, a 10-year historical. Now we're into the, now we're into the, to the ultimate historical of the town, even pre-amalgamation, when you're hitting 112 building starts was the peak of a year that we hit in, in the 80s. We're, we're at that stage now. So 100 new building starts. The, the, the uh, 
multifamily units were, were about three or four. The, the multifamily units with uh, high density, the, the apartment buildings, what we've seen is that the applications from the last year, they're still under construction. So that, that'll trickle down and it'll impact into next year. So we, we're, we're hoping to see a couple of applications in the 22 budget year. Um, and and the, we're, we're looking forward to that. Um, the, the other context that we look at from a service level is, is our pavement ratings. Our asphalt pavement ratings, if, if we recall the last bad presentations that we made with our asset management, the levels of service uh, uh, guidelines, is that our goal was to try to get above 75 in that 80 range of our average pavement ratings for the town as a whole. With our most recent street capital program, we've actually brought our um, uh, average pavement ratings up to 80 for the streets in Chris Bam Sis. However, in speaking to, to Mark and to Dwight and, and downstairs, what we, what we have to take into account is that this is the average of all of the streets, but we still have half of the streets that have yet to be rated again. So 50% uh, of the streets have not been assessed since 2019. Another 25% uh, were, were done in 2018. So we're assuming that once we get these brought up to date, the current inspection ratings, we'll see this drop back down to that 76, 77 rate where we normally are. But this is, this is a, it's, a, it's a great indicator that our, our initiatives that, that council has approved in the last few budgets of, of looking at local streets, bringing them up to a better standard, it makes us easier and it makes it more, more uh, manageable than to make sure that we can get our goal of bringing our streets up to that 80% uh, 80 pavement ratings. So the, 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 the street additions, the, the uh, pavement rankings, all are bringing us up to a certain capacity. And, and what this budget is doing is it's just say, saying that what is in place now, we can manage. We can manage it with our equipment, we can manage it with our staff levels uh, in certain areas from an operations perspective. And, and basically what that means is we're just on the cusp of, for example, one kilometer of streets, our plowing routes, are we're, we're able to do that in a four or five hour cycle. A kilometer of streets spread over 11 routes is not gonna impact it. S but we wanna, we're continuing to manage that over the next little while. So that, that where is that proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back? Where are we gonna get to the point where okay, we have to introduce a new plow route or we have to hire additional staff. That's, that's one of the things that we will be looking for in the next little while. But from this budget's perspective, the assurances are that our current level of, of, of operations is sufficient to be able to manage what we have in place. Now what we do is we step back and similar to the Director of Community Services uh, uh, presentation, in order to do that, do we have the right equipment? Is it operating properly? Are we, are, we, are we up to date on our things? And those are the things that you generally see with these operating budgets. The challenge for us is going to be at that service level. So similar to, to, to uh, the Director of Community Services presentation, we have components of this budget that are service directed. Um, as we say, personnel versus equipment. So things like public interaction, by the building inspection department, obviously, 100 new building starts with a two-person building inspection department is a challenge. Um, 2.2 million dollars of street capital when we used to do 1.5 million of street capital, it's a, it's, a, it's a staffing challenge from the engineering group's perspective. It means more inspection time, more planning time, more de design time. So, so while we are, cap we're, we are at a capacity and we're managing the, the operation side of things, that service level challenge is, 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 is at that stage now. We have to make some defined decisions for that. Um, when we look at uh, other service considerations that we look at, um, you know, the, the plowing, the things that, that we all take for granted, the plowing, the anti-icing, potholes, road repair, signage, line painting, guide rails, stormwater management. Um, uh, we, we've had discussions over the last little while from presentations from residents and non-residents alike about a our active transportation choices. Um, we've, we, we look at the traffic, uh, the traffic monitoring, the traffic management uh, dis dis directions that we have traffic calming, all these are considerations under our, our budget that we've taken when we make this presentation today. Um, the question then becomes is what is our normal operations and what our expected operations are? And as part of the asset management program, 
that becomes a decision of your level of service, not what your expectations are now. And that's where we want to take our evolution to. Um, so we can, we can continue on the current path and say, we've done this the same way, we're doing it all the way, doing it all the time, the same levels are here. At some stage, council is going to have to be able to say to us, that's great, let's stay there. And if that's the case, then we take that, that goal, that horizon, and we plan for everything out from that horizon. If council says, no, I think we can do better, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an interest for rapid flash beacons at every major crosswalk, or there's an interest for a, f a fully uh, a rural or suburban style bicycle in uh, 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 complex or, or bicycle network within the community. That's, that's where we want to be. That gives us as staff the ability now to say, okay, we know that, we're going into it. So the budget right now is the considerations. These are the things that we want to be able to make sure that we manage for you as, as, as council. The other thing we look at when we talk about level of service is the actual performance of, of what we've done over the last few years. Last winter was a, it's, it's a freak of nature. I guess it's a literal freak of nature. 24 significant storm events. Um, about 82 hours of critical overtime. Now that's not to say that the people, our staff was not responding to snow removal beyond that time. But what the, what, when we look at uh, 20, uh, significant snow events, those are uh, call outs of three hours or more. Um, and when we look at the previous years, um, we had in 2020, we had 80, uh, 47 significant snow events with 213 hours of overtime for, for, for extra hours of overtime for these critical snow events. So. We use all this information to, to trend our budgets. Um, we, we, we have a consistent number of, of driveway culvert repairs, work orders, 116 that were completed last year. Um, we carried over 34 to next year. What we've done is, is the last couple of years, we've established a budget line, and that was in a, a direction of council that said, we'll give you $82,000. And once you have all your driveway culverts at $82,000, all that money spent, then anything beyond that, unless it's an emergency, you bump it to the next year. So we, we've used that as a, as, a, as, a, as a defining line. It does two things. It gives us the ability to track our budget more accurately. It gives us the ability to, to um, respond to residents in an appropriate manner to, to be able to give them a level of expectation. Yes, we will get to your culvert this summer, or no, it will be done next year. The other thing it does is it gives our, our staff the ability to, to d then define when, does, when do we stop and transition to the winter. Because generally most of the time when we stop doing driver cover works, that's when we're transitioning to the winter. So, so those types of things are, are a consideration that we take into, into account. With our in-house uh, crews, we put down about 570 ton of asphalt. That's for potholes, shoulder works, repairs, things of that nature. Generally consistent with what we've seen in the last few years. Um, and we um, have the capacity that's increased uh, in the last two years um, if council will recall, some of the council members on, on, on the circle today is when we purchased the hot box and the asphalt recycling machine. It's extended our season. It's also give us, give, given us the ability to go beyond about four years ago. We were only putting down 400 ton of asphalt. Now we're up of that because we've extended our season. So decisions like that help, help us uh, improve that level of service. Under this consideration, we're also looking at the same level of service when it comes to animal control. Animal control, with our new uh, contracts with the NBSPCA, we've actually seen call volumes drop. Uh, from in, in, in the previous years, it was about 35, 40 calls a, a month. Now we're into that 15 to 20, 25 calls a month. And I, I, I touched base with the, the provider for the NBSPCA, and one of the things that we're finding is that the calls for animal control appeared to be a tactic. And that is to say, we would have neighbors call another on another neighbor to complain, and the only way that they would get down to complaining was because the dog was loose, the dog was barking, something like that. With the uh, NBSPC, when the NBSPCA, what we're finding is as a licensed uh, protective service officer, as animal control officers, when they go to the door, they see a fully geared up person and they, and all of a sudden they just, oh well, okay, well it's not that bad type of thing. 
So the, the tactic of complaining against your neighbor, using the animal as a, as a, as a tactic complaint, seems to have dropped a little bit. And speaking to our old uh, animal control officer, that was probably his biggest issue, was that somebody would complain, then they would complain back, and then he would just have a vicious circle of, and he'd have to log these as calls. And th that was one of the things that we've noticed with the change to, uh, to the NBSBCA is, is that, and they are actually uh, tracking for us unfounded calls as part of their reporting to us. And, and in this you know, 15, 20, 25 calls, generally they say about five or six are unfounded calls, and that's how they, they've been able to help us in that interpretation. Um, the other thing that we do from a, from a level of service perspective when it comes to the engineering group downstairs is, is, is assist the police, as I mentioned at the last council meeting, um, with, with traffic and volume speed analysis. And with our engineering group downstairs and our, our summer staff, we end up doing about 30 or 40 traffic volume analysis. And that's where we put the counters out on the street, manage to, 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 for a week at a time, get the counts. If it's high, we can report it to the police, give them an, a little bit of an assistance when it comes to policing the, uh, the traffic concerns of the particular area. So the, uh, the budget that we're going to be talking about today, as I said, it's about a $5.6 million budget. There's really no significant light item changes. And, and you all have the budget in front of you, and you can see that quite, quite easily. Um, Generally, what we did is we try to keep carry forward from year to year the consistent application of the budgets, and and anything that's um, that we've done is trying to achieve the same service level goals that we've had in the past. A lot of numbers, history is great, and you can we can use the history to help track us track the trends. And and with uh, the treasurer and her department, what they've what they've been able to do is is to to provide me with the background information to say, this is where you are. This is where we think you uh, should be, and we've adjusted numbers accordingly. Whether and, and all it takes is a freak storm, and all of a sudden your numbers are out the window. But the, the tracking exercise makes it uh, significantly easier for us to be able to plan as we go forward. And what that does is it makes sure that there's no dramatic line drop one year over the other. So if you if you consistently stick around the, the, that middle area, you're not going to see the the big swings and fluctuations and variations. And I think that's a, a great um, a tool that. Uh, the treasurer and her department has provided to our staff. Um, when we look at uh, the th when we say, okay, what is that big one? You know, the single line, the single uh, greatest line increase in operations is in our winter snow contracts. It's fourteen thousand dollars, but that's a negotiated contract. It, with the Miller Paving is actually in the their second year of a three year contract. Their rates, uh, I believe, is they're up to three hundred seventy dollars an hour for a truck within the driver supplied. Um, we provide them with the salt, sand, whatever the mixture is. We call them out as if they are. Are part of our own crew complement. They have a they have a guaranteed hours complement, but they also, as I mentioned earlier, when we have those critical calls, they actually will respond on our behalf. Um, the way that the contract is structured is that once they get above their guaranteed hours, they actually it's actually a reduced rate. So it's an 85% rate uh, once they get beyond. So it's not a, a it's not like a time and a half thing. It's actually a reduction in that rate. So it it, it is a it is a it's a, a fair and effective contract that we have, and it, it gives us the ability to. Um, manage the 12 routes that we've got, uh, eight managed in-house, four with the contractors, and it also gives us the ability to gauge if the time comes that we have to bring on a new route and manage it in, internally, buying our own extra staff, or not buying staff that would be slavery, buying a new truck, hiring staff, um, taking it through that way. Um, under the under the environmental development services and, and the general government services, the two largest items that we've got is are the completion of the subdivision standards, which is a twenty thousand uh, dollar project. Um, if the council will recall, we we started that uh, two years ago with an overview of our municipal specifications and guidelines. How do we want to build? How do we want to to, to tender our contracts? Now what we're doing is we're taking those standards and we're actually applying them to subdivisions, so that not only do we as town put a street in a certain way, we are gonna require our developers to put a street in a certain way. And so by establishing this base of standards that we have, now we can improve or change those standards, but we've, now we've got a set uh, defined uh, baseline for everybody to follow. So if we go down the road, pardon the pun, of deciding that we want to introduce bike lanes or something like that, we can say, okay, we're gonna change our street standard now to include this, or we're gonna create a street hierarchy that we're gonna do this which links into the next phase for me, which is the part B of our transportation master plan. When I talk about street hierarchy, our transportation master plan that, we, that we're completing in the next week or so, part A is reviewing the policies, the programs, some of the context that we want to look at when it comes to part B. So we're going to be producing for council in the next month a, a, 
overview document of our master transportation plan. What that will do is it'll give you the hot points, the top, the hot topic buttons that we found and our consultants found in reviewing the, the standards that we have for the town. It was a, it was a, um, an effective process that we feel that gives us the ability and the capacity to, to go out and say, all right, what have we got in front of us? What are the challenges going to be? Um, what do we want to make sure we want to plan for in the future? What are the resources we have available to our disposition now? What is the street inventory like now? Those types of things come into play. The part B now says, okay, you have this, here's what you do with it, or here's how you change it to this, or this is a new standard that's it being used in British Columbia, it's coming this way, you may want to consider it. So those are the types of things that our master transportation plan will bring for us in the, in the part B. That's a, that is a fixed quote from our consultant, $64,000 to complete that part B of that document. Um, when we look at the transportation side of the budget, and, and that includes our engineering group, the overall fleet costs, there's a slight increase about $15,000 over the 2021 levels. Um, and that's mainly associated as the fleet gets older, um, costs go up and, and those types of things are translated. Also, as our fleet gets a little larger, those costs are coming into play as well. And those, those costs are vehicle maintenance, fuel costs, um, uh, things of that nature, and that's spread over the public works group, the engineering group, the building inspection group. So all those, those, those fleet costs are, 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 are pulled together in that number. Our uh, driver culvert budget, we're proposing a slight increase because we're seeing those demands stay consistent the last few years in that 100, 115 number range. And we feel that an, an $82,000 uh, increase is, uh, is appropriate. So we're proposing that increase uh, for the 2022 budget. As I touched on, our snow contracts did increase slightly, about $14,000. And while it's not um, uh, in, under my direct responsibility, the COMEX is actually part of the, the, uh, the Transportation Budget Center, and that's a, a slight reduction, and that will be spoken to by uh, our acting CAO in a later presentation. So with the transportation in the winter, um, as I said, the, the two main increases are the, uh, the uh, snow contracts and the vehicle MNR. And the summer budget, is, again, is that vehicle MNR when you look at those uh, line items. And uh, I, uh, the, 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 the package that you have in front of you um, are, are relatively straightforward. We have tried in the past um, when we project a slight increase where the finance committee will come to me and say, listen, you've got $30,000 in your budget for vehicle maintenance. Do you think you can live with 25,000? Sure, I can live with 25,000, but when the truck breaks down, I'm gonna be $5,000 over or I'm still gonna, you know, it's, it's gonna be. So unless the council says that's your budget, if it breaks down, shut it down, which I don't think I've heard, I've ever heard in my 34 years, I, you know, the, the flexibility of the budget is there. However, what we try to do is we don't try to say oh, we're padding, uh, padding a budget that just doesn't come into play in this, in this particular aspect. Our, our environmental development services, and now it's a big fancy word for our municipal planning officer, the planning advisory committee, um, the, the uh, regional facilities, things of that nature. The environmental growth of the community is one that is, is evolving as we see the changes in the, in, in the approach being taken. I'm sure um, in Visit St. John is gonna have a, a significant impact on how they attract business. And that trickle down for us is where do the people come to live? And what we've seen is that Quispamsis is the destination of choice when it comes for new dwelling units in the, in the, in the region. So the, the, the environmental development of services component means that we have to be able, we, we have to be prepared for it. Things like our municipal plan. Our municipal plan is not just um, deciding where, you know, how far a fence should be from a building, how far, you know, what size of, of, a, of, a, of a lot is required for development. But it also means that we are looking at uh, proposals of council, that we want to be a sustainable community, that we want to undertake certain uh, initiatives. All these things come into, under, under play of our municipal plan. All are done with the, con the, 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 under the general auspices of supporting our, our comprehensive asset management plan. And we've continued on that, on that path, um, recognizing that, as I touched on earlier, they're just little steps. We're taking the steps that we need to, to be to, to take us there. Um, 
But in order to do that, our environmental services group, environmental development group, manages our GIS. The geographic information system is that mapping software that is used to project um, growth patterns, is used to project uh, uh, high water levels for uh, uh, predictive flood layers, for zoning maps. All those things are in support of growth, but it is a cost to the environmental development department because we have to, we have to create these documents and, and produce them. As I touched on earlier, the, the development of the standards um, and the revisions that the standards that we're bringing into play, such as stormwater management, asphalt standards, water and sewer standards, we have to communicate that to the developers. We have to make sure that that's where, but we also have to inspect and make sure that they're being constructed to a certain level. Um, I saw last night on a, I think it was SEALs team TV, it was the title of the show was Trust But Verify. And it's the same thing that we have with our developers. Yes, they'll have a consultant out. They'll have the design done by that. They may have their consultant on board inspecting the work. And yeah, we trust them to a degree because they have a certain uh, standard to ad appear adhere to. But in the field, those decisions that are being made by their operators are things that our staff, my staff, will go out and inspect to make sure that it's in compliance with our standards. So those are the things that we, 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 we have to make sure that we're prepared to do. And we're shifting our focus just to the strategic plan. Council has the strategic planning initiative that you're undertaking in the, in the next few months and over the next uh, extended period. And what that does is it then um, gives uh, oversight and an overview and a guiding principle to my group to make sure that the documents that we then introduce are consistent with your plan. Uh, and to, to, to Councillor Luck's point about the timing of these things, what we're seeing is that the strategic plan exec, uh, exercise that Council is going to be undertaking because it's already been started, there's a plan, there's a timing for it, we can very easily take all our subsequent plans that are being proposed, master recreation plan as well, and incorporate that into, this, into the timeline. So it's not gonna be, we're not doing something in advance of, we're doing something in, in, the, in the correct order. So that's the, the important thing that, once we know that council is committed to the strategic plan exercise, it makes my job, our job, a lot easier because then we can structure our our processes after your your exercise. So while we don't have it in this current budget proposal, you will be hearing from my group for things like a stormwater master plan, uh, you know, uh, uh, the evolution of our a wastewater master plan, things of that nature. Um, so so that strategic exercise that we're undertaking really drives all of our supporting legislation, whether it be the building bylaw, the zoning bylaw. Um, subdivision bylaw, and, and even the initiatives of the Planning Advisory Committee. Um, we're shifting our focus now to the, those next phases, you know, and what that master recreation, uh, master transportation plan, sorry, uh, will be do for us is it will make sure that we have appropriate recommendations for upgrades to the, our networks. Now, our networks under this master transportation plan are not just street networks. This is sidewalks. This is, um, we're looking at the, the, uh, the COMEX uh, in general, not specific to the COMEX, but those types of things. We're looking at, at uh, you know, the, the request for uh, walking, walkability, cycleability. One, and, and I, I sort of take a little aside, when we were talking about the bicycles, two things, and I think uh, Mr. Gillis mentioned it the other night, the e-bikes are, are a game changer for, the, for this community. Because when we look at our mapping and you look at a community, and, and um, all of you I'm sure have driven around, is there's, there, if you see a flat place in the town, cherish it because 15 feet later, it's gonna be a hill. And so one of the driving factors why we haven't seen a lot of bike lanes is because people don't wanna drive up hills. They love going down hills, but they don't wanna go up hills. And the, our, our topography is, is a driving component when we, and that was one of the discussion items that we had when we were looking at the, the parameters of our master transportation plan, is this is, this is, this is a hilly place. And that that's going to impact a lot how you do how we choose to do things. Um, it, uh, you know, we we look, and as an AT project, the master plan helps us to define okay, what are the projects that you want to identify as priorities? And again, it goes back to where does council want to see as their as their vision. So by having this this initial document in place, we can give it to council as part of your strategic exercise. You say, well, here's what we've heard, here's what we think we want, then we take what you want and in incorporate it into the master plan itself. 
and bring you back that document. So it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, evolution-based system that's consistently dependent on your feedback and your input as, as decision makers for the community. So um, the engineering department itself, um, we touch all, I, can't, I shouldn't say that's not, that's not the proper way to say it, I guess, but we, we, we help with all the departments in that we, are, we, we manage all the general and utility capital projects. We oversee all the subdivision development in the town. We, we undertake all of the traffic control, all the traffic safety, all the traffic calming initiatives. Um, infrastructure assessment and condition assessment projects, um, even though they may be in different departments, uh, the engineering group, whether it's from a mapping perspective or for an actual hands-on inspection perspective, will be involved in that as we evolve our asset management plan. We are, it's a better way to say it, like I said, a technical resource for all the other departments in the community. Now, we're, 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 when we talk about our capacity, we are working to make sure that we develop in-house capacity to, to a higher standard. Um, as the province or the town decides this is a higher level uh, or there's an expectation, then our staff, my staff, have to be able to say, yes, we can meet those expectations and, and the development of that staff and making sure that there's an appropriate complement of that staff to make sure that it's done timely fashion is, is, is valid. Um, we have to be prepared not only to enforce, but monitor, but, uh, but also advise on, on these standards. And we have to be able to make sure that we serve as a resource that um, we are up to date on everything that's happening and those trends that are happening in the, in the industry is, and, and the, our acting CAO talked about th this town being as a, a, an innovator, uh, respected as a leader in, in a lot of items in the province of Brunswick and land in Canada, if not across Canada. We'd like to think that I, you know, our group has, has taken those steps to be that resource for the other bases because a lot of times we can't, we can't do a, an asset management plan if we didn't have the GIS. We were one of the first communities to introduce a map-based GIS. So we were able to take our asset management plan to that next level. So those types of initiatives I think are, are, are primarily as a result of the atmosphere that this and previous councils have granted our, our staff to be able to think outside the box. Um, so under our engineering budget, there's two main additions. Um, one we're propo proposing, uh, the payroll budget is proposed an extra entry level full-time technician. It's in that pay band 40. Uh, it's about a 53 to $67,000 a year staff uh, payroll. But it's gonna provide us with additional technical support uh, for our capital programs. It'll help control the construction of the, of the development. Um, it'll provide us with that extra level of staff for condition assessments and, and asset management. Um, a, a, an example that I'll, I'll go to in, in speaking with our, our engineering manager, we've, we just did a $2.2 million street capital program. Now that's designed totally in-house. That's planned, surveyed, uh, tender administration, tendered, inspected in-house. That would start, it, it would start tomorrow if this was, you know, this was approved budget. But January first, we'll say that it starts. Um, we 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 actually will have staff dedicated to to taking all the streets, laying them out, designing them, bringing them forward, getting the tender ready. We put the tender out in May, early April, uh, so it's awarded in May. First council meeting, second council meeting, May. We get great asphalt prices because we are able to do that in house, set it early. The project starts as soon as the weight restrictions come off the road. They're working. They're actually still working now. So this is the end of October. Um, and the deficiencies will be addressed over the next little while. So this is a full year program. We have one, one, one staff member that's managing this with help from other people because they're, they're spread around. In the summertime, we bring on a summer student, two summer students, engineering students. Probably the greatest, I wish I had that ex this, this experience, I wish I had that level of experience when I was an engineering student, but I, but I didn't, so I can't go back. But I, one of the things that the engineering manager and I wanted to do is make it a valuable and worthwhile experience. And in doing that, so we've got a first or second year engineering student managing a $2.2 million construction project when the full-time tech is doing something else. Risk, potentially. So we see that as, as a place that should be managed a little bit more efficiently and effectively is by having a full-time staff with the capacity, the skill set, the knowledge, and, the, and the, the enforcement capacity to manage that project. Not, not to mention that a summer student only shows up in June and leaves in August, so I've got four other months of, of, of spreading somebody thin. 
So, so that, that's just one example of where we feel that the, the, the desire, the request for the, the full-time uh, technical staff is, is warranted. Um, uh, the other one is uh, the traffic calming. The, all these, these, the level of traffic calming that we've undertaken, um, the reports, as, as on a Monday, Monday morning, they've got to go out, take the counters out. We've got four sets of counters to go through the town. It's, and, and I'll be the first to say, you do not want to be at eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the morning with your back to the street, putting down a, a counter and not having somebody watching you. So those, those are the types of things that we've got summer staff doing um, that uh, really, they're, they're done in twos, they're done safely, they're signed the whole bit. But again, this is something we want to be able to manage a little bit better when we do this. So again, that's that's the, the rationale for this presentation when it comes to the full-time tech position. I know staff generally, uh, staffing issues is, is, is a concern for council as a, as a whole because it's a legacy, it's a continuing, it's an impact. It's not, oh, it's just a, it's not a one-time thing. This is a go forward basis. And we feel at this stage of the game, it's, it's uh, under the engineering group, it's a, it's a valid request and we're making that in this budget ad ask th of this year. Um, and we talked about the specification and guidelines, so we, we really won't carry forward on that. Uh, under this protection group, we see the, the building inspection group. That's a, I think it's a, it's a wicked couple of charts. Those are the trends of demands in the last 10 years for building starts in the town of Gwispamsis. And um, as I touched on a little earlier, you know, we're, 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 we, when this was present, started, when I prepared the document, we are at 79. By the time this was printed, we were over 80. By the end of the year, we'll be over 100 starts. Uh, it's, it's not, we're just not able to keep up with it. And even though the starts from, from middle October till, till the end of the year, there'll be, there'll be 20 starts, but that doesn't, they don't stop then. This is, this is the contractor getting foundations in the ground so that they can keep their people working over the winter. So now I've got people building over the winter but it still requires technical support, technical staff. And that's the demand that we're seeing that that's changing our building inspection group, the approach that we're taking. Because in the past, when you hit that 50, 60 starts, you might have one or two starts that are over the winter and you have the ability to step back, regroup, manage your resources, um, get your documentation back in place, get everything up to date. But what we're finding now is we're, we're, we're playing catch up with a lot of our, our, our material. No, it's not causing us issues with the inspection side of things, but it's everything else. And at some point, that paperwork is going to get caught up. And so what we're proposing under the building inspection group is, is to, to, to bring on a, an additional summer staff to help with the non-technical, sort of the, the, the low-hanging fruit, things like sheds, um, uh, fences, things of that nature. What that does is now gives our technical uh, staff the ability to go out and focus on the important inspections, come back, be able, to, be able to work with uh, each other to be able to say, okay, what's next that has to be done? So it, it, that's really the, the, the only major change that we're proposing under the building inspection group. And the reason that we're taking this approach is the, the previous graphs, they're, they're going up, but we really don't feel that that's a sustainable um, pattern that we're gonna see. We'll, we'll see it drop back down over the next little while. And um, what we're projecting is um, that at this stage, it's not a, f a requirement for a full-time staff, but we want to manage it as, as best we can with the, with the summer seasonal staff or summer student staff. Um, the, the, as I touched on a little earlier, the animal control project is, 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 um, is being well received with the, the New Brunswick SPCA. Um, they're in their second year of a three-year term. Um, it has a, 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 a capped increase with either the 2.5 or the NBCPI, whichever is, whichever is less. So um, we, we know where that is trending. The numbers are down obviously um, because of the change in the format of our tender. So the, the budget itself is saving us about $10,000 this year. So it's, it's, it is a reduction in, in the budget. Um, as a, and as I touched on, touched on earlier, the one major thing that we've seen by the change in this is that they are better at um, weeding out those unfounded calls. So when we, we, when we talk about and the, the mantra of, 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 of all the councils, the last roads, 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 or waterway, whatever, this is the roads, roads, roads part, and I'm not going to do the can-can, but it is the roads, roads, roads part. 
so the, the staff is based on our, our asset management um, level of service mapping that we, we've done. We've prepared a, a street capital program that is um, $2.2 million for the year 2022. And our, our equipment capital side of things is about $726,000. Um, I don't know, if, uh, Aaron, if you, if you can click on that link, the uh, proposed street capital map on the bottom, that should take us up. It should hopefully will work, yeah. Um, and, and with the, the, the town and what we've done is, is, and if you recall the last few years, we've taken the, the map and, and basically spread it out through areas based on roads that are in dry, dire need of asphalt for the resurfacing and uh, based on our traffic volumes, the pavement ratings and things of that nature. We also look at streets that are perhaps, may, that may be a little close together um, in discussions with our, our contractors that we've, we've engaged in the past, they appreciate the fact that uh, if we group streets in a, in a subdivision or close together, it cuts down on our mobilization costs. So they pass that savings on to us. And, and I think that's one of the things that, um, that helps us in, in our programs as we go forward. Um, the, the street list is there. Um, I will, we'll break it down a little bit um, in, in the next couple of pages. So, so we'll get into a little bit more details with regards to the specific capital program. Uh, the, the trending that we, that, that we touched on, because we're, we're an eff effective and efficient um, uh, process for putting our tender packages together, we actually benefit from the, uh, the trends that we've seen. Things like our asphalt unit prices, and you can see that there, and, and it's always an interesting, when you open up a, a sealed bid and you say, oh, what was the asphalt? What was, it? what was the tonnage? And it comes out and you're lower than the city or you're lower than Ross and you go, that's all we want to see, that's great. You know, and, and they're putting out bigger projects or similar size project. And what that tells me is that we've got people bidding because they want to be here. There's a, there's a, there's a, a, a we pay on time. We work well with the contractors. We uh, make sure that they have a proper work environment and, and they have the capacity to be able, to, if there's a dispute, it's resolved amicably. And in doing that, they recognize that they can come here, do the work, get out, go to the next job. And, and that's reflected in our actual prices. Um, consistently. Uh, projecting for next year, we prepared our budgets and with generally we prepared around $100 a ton asphalt and um, what the contractors are saying is that this year they were about $22 a ton under their profit margins, if you can believe the asphalt contractors. But the, the, so, so they said don't expect that again. So we're thinking that they'll probably be in the 90s but We'll wait and see, because a lot of it depends on how hungry they are. If they didn't happen to get a big contract, a provincial contract or whatever, or the city contract, then they may say, okay, I need something to keep my people working, and then they come in. But we're seeing that trend work, work for us in our, to our advantage. And so when we look at uh, the, the parameters of our street capital program, you know, it's based on making sure that we can get all of our 60 pavement rated streets resurfaced in a 10-year in a in a, in a program. And what that does is uh, the more 60 or lower rated streets you get up, the easier it is to keep your average rating up, which is what we, which is what we base our, our, our goals on. So we assess the, the pavement surfaces. We look at what's under there for the gravels. It, some of the older subdivisions were, were well built and we can go in and just do a seal or a recap on a street. Some of them were, were when you speak about the proverbial cow path, that's what they were constructed on is the cow path. And we're digging out stumps, corduroy road, you know, cedar logs put together as a corduroy road. So we actually have to reconstruct a lot of these streets. So we look at that. What we do is in advance of every contract, we'll take a geotechnical company, take all the streets on our list, do boreholes in all the streets so we, there's no surprises to us. We know what's in the ground so we can actually plan for it. We look at traffic volumes. Is it a high volume street? Should, should it warrant being done earlier or sooner? Things of that nature. Um, and, and the approach that we've taken the last few years and, and council has, has seemed to, to uh, work with this is that we try to spread out, spread the wealth, so to speak, that we do a collector road or a portion of a collector road and that chews up anywhere from five to six to $700,000 of our budget. And we do an, uh, about six or seven or eight local streets that are in demand. And that helps to make sure that we're not just focusing on, on a main road, we're actually spreading the, the, uh, the asphalt into the subdivisions because the subdivisions actually were, are, um, some of them have been there longer than some of the main roads. Um, 
So we, 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 we look, at, as I touched, we touched on the economy of scale, we look at grouping streets, and, and then council obviously has that last input if there's a special priority that you as councillors feel should be addressed. And we try to make sure that that's incorporated into the plan. And a lot of times you do have that special request and last year was a prime example. Last year we said that we want, we're gonna borrow X dollars, we're gonna add it on top, we want these three streets added to your list. Perfect. Uh, a couple of the councillors know that if you give me money, I will pave. It's like the field of dreams, right? So if we look at the, 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 the different streets, and these are general photos during the inspection process and some follow-ups and, and um, you know, like things like Sunnybank, you know, all of the streets are in that range, that 60, 65, 54 range. Sunnybank, Rainer Drive, Parkside Road, uh, Regal, Rinlon and Hill Court. The bottom three are in the same subdivision, so you'll see some economies in that particular project. We go over to this up the hill, up the old Swanton subdivision, Swanton, Muriel, Sylvia. Oh, those are in that same subdivision. Um, we were a little hesitant on those particular streets because of the potential for development in the, on the lower side of Su below Susan and Swanton. But at this stage of the game, we felt that the road conditions warranted asphalt and we're gonna have to work with the, any future development on, on their paths and their traffic levels before we, before we uh, uh, so we can let them proceed. But we did, really didn't wanna hold up some of these streets a little longer than we had to. Braun and Pleasant and the old Gondola Point are, are the last couple of streets in that stretch along that side hill. We've done Lo Ken Yu, Logan in that area on that high side um, once we get that done. Uh, above us here, a couple of the bigger roads that we're looking at, the, the old coach road and the hovey road that were brought to council a couple of meetings ago. Um, and with our community uh, bills fund, the old gas tax fund where we want to put in water, the water extension, we've actually uh, identified these streets to be uh, a, a great uh, connection that we can get water in the ground, get that infrastructure in place, and then pave over top of it, and, and we're out of that particular area. A couple of uh, councillors have asked about Roberts Lane, and some of the residents are asking about why aren't we paving it now once we dig it up. Uh, it is on the street capital for next year, $240,000, the full length of Roberts Lane, and really the, 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 the philosophy that we take is that this time of year, you've got major construction, you've got ex excavation depths anywhere from three meters to six meters, in that area, there's gonna be some settlement. I really don't wanna spend good money by putting asphalt down and have something settle over the winter time. So we'd much rather give it the winter to settle, give the opportunity with a base coat of asphalt. If we have to go in and then pulverize and recreate and, and recrown the road, that's, the, that's the, the appropriate time to do that. So that's, where, that's why Roberts Lane is on the list for next year, not being done as part of the, uh, the completion of the street program now. Slim, similarly, and it's not on the photos here, uh, Brook Street is, is being done this year Council recall, one of the concerns was that we thought we might have to do a lot of the work next year uh, as part of the carry up. We've actually been able, to, the contractor's schedule has been, uh, been great and the weather's contributed to this as well. We've been able to get all of the storm sewer that we wanted on Brook Street. We've actually got the road reconstruction in place. We're actually getting the base asphalt. So the only thing that we have to carry over to next year is about $50,000 for a seal coat to finish all of the asphalt. So that's a, that's a, that's a, it's a, it's the process that we wanna do is to make sure that anything we put in the ground can withstand that, that winter, and, and that's the approach that we want to take for it. Um, the, one of the big collector roads that we're looking at, uh, the Means Cove Road, the resurfacing of that Means Cove Road, it's about 545 grand, takes us from the arterial up to Fullier Drive. Um, the Lynx, Fullier, Collingwood, Executive, uh, Rockefeller, those, that's, that's flexible in that what we're gonna determine is once the tender is opened, we're gonna decide, okay, how, how much can we get done? and Where do we wanna go? Generally speaking, when we're looking at roads like this, you're talking about anywhere from 250 to $400 a meter extra to do, to do the road work. And, and what we want to be able to, to, to look at is the rest of the streets, once they're done, the tender results, and then we come back to council and say, hey, we have the capacity, if you recall, this summer we said, we can do all of Hammond River Road because we had asphalt. And council was great and said, hey, tell you what, we found a 20 in my winter coat that's yours. You can do the Ham River Road too. Oh, great. So things like that will happen for us. So we want to take advantage of that. So, so the Means Cove Road is at this stage of the game is, is a phase, first phase of, of, project, uh, of construction. And that could be a four phase, three phase, depends on the budget allocation that we want to make. Um, so, so that's the, the, one of the projects. 
And we're also proposing in the capital program uh, $100,000 for the Gondola Point Road. Uh, so it's essentially what we're calling is a corridor analysis. This could be similar to the work that we did on the Gondola Boulevard, where we introduced that the traffic calming, the dedicated bicycle, or the de de separated walking lane, the islands, things of that nature. Not to say that we're going to put islands on the Gondola Point Road, but we want to be able to take it to the public and to council and say, okay, we want to pave the Gondola Point Road. Great but we also wanna make sure that it has appropriate pedestrian and cyclist access, perfect. We wanna make it a designated scenic route. Oh, okay, great. What do we wanna do there? What is that vision? And then, then, we can, then we sit back and say, this is the style that we wanna have. So we wanna go through that exercise with the consultant, be able to take it to the public at large, throw out some ideas, see what sticks. Obviously, there's gonna be some, some issues. We're constrained, we got one side of a road, that's the river, that's not moving. And, and I don't think we get a Wawa to move it. So we're stuck going to the other side. You look at that other side, go down the road. Some of the homes are nice back, set back. Some of them are right there. Some of them, the trees, there's a bank that's like this. You have space, some places you don't. So those types of questions are gonna have to be asked. Do we take the sidewalk and continue it from Rossi all the way through? Do we decide, no, we, we can live with a proper de designated signed and uh, cycling lane and a, and a walking with designated lane. Those are the questions that we want to have asked with this with this review. Um, so so we feel this is a, an appropriate way to make sure that it's addressed. This the overriding principle with this one is going to be that we still have three lift stations on that Gondola Point Road that have to be replaced. So before we replace those lift stations, we want to know that a we have a plan how we're going to reinstate the road. B we're not going to pave a road in a different phase and then put a lift station in and dig it up after we've paved it. Too many communities around this area do that, so we said, we're not going to do that. Or C, we say, well, you know what? We can live with what's there, go forward. So those, those types of things are going to come into play in this. This is, the, this is the document that's going to lay out the approach for the Gondola Point Road, predictable for the next little while. Council, uh, uh, finance committees has also thrown a curveball, and, and uh, I, this is always great. They've, they've said that we think that there should be a $100,000 designated for sidewalks or something in the town budget. No specific location. Okay, I can live with that. Um, our transportation master plan is yet to be completed, so we, we don't have uh, uh, priority from council or from, I've got some ideas. Um, $100,000, if you take, uh, depending on what type of sidewalk you put in there, you could only get 50 meters, which is a lot and a half. Ugh, that's not a lot of sidewalk. So what we want to do, are we, uh, so when we, when we take that, we say, okay, are we going to extend an existing sidewalk? We've had requests for the uh, Ecole Pionier in front of the school. They want to take the sidewalk from the end of the Quispam Road down past the school. It'll take, it'll, it, the, to connect to the walking trail at, at, the, uh, at the Old Coach Road Bridge. That's an option. You want a new sidewalk. Um, the Old Coach Road where we're putting the water main repairs in is connected to the system. We can extend that and add, add that money to the Old Coach Project and we, now, now we've got sidewalk that's starting into the subdivisions, and we can loop it back around to Cannon Road or the Gorham Road and get back up to the Hampton Road. So there's a sidewalk opportunity. Do we want to take the money and say we're going to widen the roadway, add it to the Means Cove Road budget, and add a meter onto the Means Cove Road? Uh, again, that's an opportunity that we have there. Whatever we do, we have to account for the fact that we have to maintain these things. We have to be able to say, okay, we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to just put a sidewalk, oh, I'm going to put a sidewalk on at the end of Queensbury Drive, I've got no snow plows to go down Queensbury Drive with a sidewalk in it. I do have sidewalks through here, a sidewalk plows that go through here, so anything that, that's on an addition sidewalk that I can add to, it's gonna be no problem to maintain. If we widen the road, similar to the decisions of previous councils where we had said we wanted to put a sidewalk, they said, it's a little bit too rich for our bloods, can we widen the roadway? We widen the roadway, and we can maintain it with a plow, just wing it right off. So those are, those are the considerations that we have to make. So um, I guess when you look at, at uh, you know, those costs, sidewalks itself, concrete, the whole bit, curb and gutter, it's about $250 a linear meter. You add storm sewer in there, there's another $200 a meter if you have to put in storm sewer. If you want to put a bike lane in, that's about $250 a meter. If you want to put bike lanes on both sides of the road, you're talking about $500 a meter. So those types of costs, you know, uh, one kilometer of two lane bike lanes, even just adding a kilometer, one meter, it's half a million dollars. 
So to Mr. Gillis's point about, oh, we'll just paint the lines, yeah, you can do that. But it's going to, but you still need the, that little bit of asphalt to get you to that point if you're talking both sides. So those are the considerations that we want to take into account when we look at this hundred thousand dollars. So um, I guess I guess the 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 question for council is if as we go through the discussion later on is the priorities or any ideas or thoughts that we want to have for that. The uh, the, the last bit we've got on the uh, capital overview is the equipment. Placing a snowplow, those run about a 12 to 15 year replacement cycle. The particular unit that we're looking at is on 17 years now. So we 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 look at the industry standard, we look at our repair man, our repair uh, requirements, and we look at the performance of the particular piece of equipment. And we, we have generally exceeded our fleet uh, replacement cycle. So that's, that's a good thing. However, when we get to that stage, it's gotta be done, it's gotta be replaced. Um, and, and we don't take that recommendation lightly because it is 340 grand for a big piece of gear that it's like big boys, big toys for big little boys, or big toys for big boys, this is what it is. Um, highly technical piece of equipment, single man operated, single person operated plows, wing uh, salt control, AVL rated. Um, we'll look at incorporating incorporating uh, uh, liquid ash, liquid brine uh, applications for collector roads. So, so we want to keep this as current as we can. So that's that's the the big ticket item. We've got general fleet repairs. Uh, we've got a one ton that's uh, um, it's about ten years uh, out of uh, out of cycle. Um, that we're proposing to be replaced. Um, uh, we've got the, the wheeled excavator that was awarded. Uh, if council re recall, we committed to that. That's a, that uh, was a project we spread over the two budgets. So the, the top up is, is in this year's but proposed in this year's budget. We have storm sewer um, in the community at large, and we've got a meeting next week to go over the priorities that we've established for that. But generally, what we do is we take all the requests from the residents, from our works department, from our utility department. If there's a problem area in the winter time, we'd much rather say, okay, what does it take to um, fix it in the summertime so we don't have to go out in the wintertime for ice up, things of that nature. So, or if there's a drainage problem where people have basements are flooding, if those problems come to us, then we can plan for the subsequent year. And generally what we've seen is uh, we can get about four or five different areas, anything from a $12,000 catch basin that's installed to a $56,000 stretch of roadway that's has storm sewer installed. So we feel this is a great improvement uh, approach to, to stormwater improvement. Of that, uh, there's a local improvement component and that's where the residents, if they themselves wish to, to partner with the town for essentially aesthetic reasons, they say, I'd like to fill in my ditch. As long as we can do it and meet a certain standard they, and they're willing to cost share, that's identified in this local improvement budget. Um, we were continuing with our, our, our program for miscellaneous traffic control and pedestrian safety items, about $15,000. Those are those rapid flash beacons that we've talked about at some of the dif different uh, intersections. Generally, we can get uh, two sets of rapid flash beacons and one pair of uh, radar lights for the town. If it, that fluctuates from year to year depending what the demand is. From a traffic calming perspective, we, we've looked at the radar lights, we've looked at humps, the traffic, the plastic, the humps that we want. Uh, we looked at the diversions. Um, I actually just came back from Ottawa last week and in some of the local subdivisions, and I was in Quebec uh, last year, that they're using, they're using mid-block uh, mid crossing signage. And what that is, is, is halfway through the, side, the, the street, they actually have a paddle you know, three, two feet, three feet tall that, that can go in the wind, but it's actually children or crossing, whatever. And, and actually, it's the road is narrowed down at that location and it slows you down. So that's something else we're gonna be looking at this summer is investment in those types of, uh, of uh, traffic calming. The final item that we've got, um, and we've spoken about it uh, for a couple of years, is uh, the Pettingo Road, the traffic uh, control system. We're looking to upgrade the controllers at that location, installing um, overhead radar vehicle detection. So what that is not, it's not red light cameras. Basically it's, if you pull up into a lane, the camera senses your presence, like the almighty being, like the Ouija guy, says, oh, there should be somebody there that needs to turn. There's nobody else in any other lanes. Okay, send the signal, that car can turn, and then it'll go through its cycle. So the, what, what it is, is it, it's gonna replace some of the in-ground loops that are, uh, that are um, the connectivity is lost. The, over time, they, the wires break, they've shorted out. So some of them are operating down there, some of them are not. But with the, with the overhead sensors, we have the ability to monitor 
all the lanes and be able to make sure that the traffic levels stay uh, as where they are or where they uh, or, or better. Uh, at this level, that uh, is operating at a level C, I believe. We want to get it up to a level B. C is basically between C and B. It's it's how long do you wait if you wait through more than one light to get through the intersection or things of that nature. So we want to, this is what we're proposing in this year's project. So. So from an engineering and works perspective, that's uh, that's that presentation. If there are specific questions, because I after that I've got utility and general and operating, and I figure there's a pile of questions that people have from an engineering perspective that we may want to, with your worship's indulgence, if you want to have questions now. Thank you, uh, Mr. Loger, and certainly seeing growth uh, at this point in time, that we will see a hundred new homes in Quispamsis is just mind-blowing. It's uh, certainly significant to all aspects of our town with, uh, with all that we have to offer as a municipality. Um, tracking trends is a huge component, uh, as you've said, to planning your work. And certainly the unpredictable is weather, uh, whether it's hurricanes, floods, or snowstorms. And, and that's something that we, we try to track and include that in our budget. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was uh, with subdivision standards, uh, that is something that we can also tie in with climate change because I know that uh, in talking uh, with uh, Trevor Murray, um, certainly they're trying to incorporate some new building standards that will look at climate change. And I think that is on the cutting edge and where we should be. When we speak of EV bikes, I do think that's a game changer as well. And those hills and the topography that Quispamsis uh, provides uh, that, we, that we are built on uh, will certainly now be conquered by, by uh, cyclists of, of all types. So um, every public street we're hoping will be at some point shareable in some way or another. Uh, for all modes of transportation. So it is 5 to 12. Would you like a half hour of questions now, or would you like to break for lunch? Break for lunch. Could we ha see hands? If you'd like to continue on for half an hour, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, five to two. So we'll go for another um, 25, 30 minutes, but if anyone would like to use the facilities, certainly just go. And, and we'll try to speak over Councillor Olson's stomach rumbling. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll go to questions. I'm going to the first in the queue. Councillor Donovan. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I don't have a question, just a comment. Um, I do really like those uh, rapid flash beacons I've, I've watched in our community and they work really well. I just got um, back from Halifax and Dartmouth a couple weeks ago and they act, they're so behind. They have flags. You pick a flag up and you walk across the street and then you leave the flag. It was, it was just bizarre to me. So I'm glad we have those, um, those uh, flash beacons. Thanks. The, uh, the flags actually is, is, is behind the times. Some people consider them cutting edge because it's an on-demand uh, system that if, and, and I think the action CIA were talking about it the other day, actually, quite frankly, it's funny you bring them up, is if they can't see you with a flag like this, and they, then there's a lot more to worry about than, than that. So I know that Yarmouth has used them in the past, and the biggest issue is people stealing the flags. They, for whatever reason, the flags go grow legs. Thank you, uh, Councillor Donovan. We are going to next in the queue, and that would be Councillor Bigger. Thank you, Your Worship, and thanks for the great uh, presentation. Um, lots and lots in there, and and uh, and of course utilities coming up after that. So it's power packed. So that's why that's why I get paid the big bucks. <laughs> Dana brought all the fun stuff first, and then she's touchy feely. Yeah, right. Yeah. And then you get up and, you know. No, no, I can't say that. You, yeah, you look like you're dressed for a TED talk today, which is nice, but. Uh, Just call me TED. Bring in the pain. Anyway, yeah. no, great presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, sort of also connected to the um, idea of the rapid flash beacons and so on. We passed the motion a couple of weeks ago to request the of DTI about the uh, <clears throat> possibility of getting the speed limit reduced and the. Uh, rapid flash beacon for the crosswalk by the high school. And I know that we're waiting to hear, and I don't believe there's an update currently on that, but 
uh, I know that we had opted to not make that a 22 budget item because we were hoping that DTI would give us an early Christmas present and just sort of cover it. But then also you had mentioned about how we'll get to a point soon enough where it may be sort of like the conditions become deleterious as far as the ground conditions to try to do an install, even if they do come back. So there is probably the potential that we end up in 22 despite our best efforts. But I just wonder if this if this budget component uh, takes that into consideration at all, or would do we have the flexibility? Should we have to add that later on that it won't become something that's put off even further? Yeah, what we do is we identify two locations and generally in conduct concert with the active transportation group. Um, that's not to say that if it falls apart with DTI that we can't reallocate from where we have planned to that location. So the cap the capacity could be there. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's 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 flexible enough that um, we have the the ability to, to move up priority a little bit here and there. Yeah. Okay. And one other just quick comment. I just wanted to say that um, I I I I can I perceive the sort of the 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 tender nature of kind of trying to you know bear in mind the um, need for AT considerations to be built into sort of road improvements going forward. And uh, I'm just a little concerned about how it, how it practically does dovetail. It seems as though the implications of, like we just had uh, Mr. Gillis, was it, in the other night? And I mean, of course, before that it was uh, Wayne, uh, what's his name, Arrow? Aerosmith. And we've got a decade old, I mean, I'm brand new, of course, but we have a decade old document and strategy that I don't know if it's other than saying it will cost this much more to do this. I'm not sure what practical moves are being made to try to bear those in mind going forward. And I just so I far be it from me to try to exhibit any expertise on that. But I just want to express my concern about how we're going to somehow get the Venn diagram in yeah. in action on the, this. And the thing to recognize is the ten year old di the ten year old document that that was being talked about. The good parts were adopted, in a as well as at that time, adopted by council the fact that we were going to incorporate sharrows and a shared road system into the network for bicycles. So the the document itself was not ignored and it was adopted as presented relatively completely. What is happening is it's a new standard that this particular person or the group is rest requesting of council of the town. That the request back at ten years ago was, okay, we have to make this a, a, a safer area. Is it Sharrow's? And that was accepted, and that was the, the practice of the time. So the same way that you have a building code that changes for the energy code, the changes that come after the fact, we can't be held, we can't be held to, uh, uh, for penance for what we did 10 years ago, meeting the standards or the requests that were made at that time of the day. So the, you know the whole shame on you philosophy that people may come here and approach the town is not it's not warranted, and and I, I credit the director of community services. I'm glad we're wearing masks. We're not you know chewing blood through our teeth. But the things that are put in place now are are stuff is stuff that was asked and requested and implemented by virtue of those documents. Because somebody comes and says I don't like that anymore or we should do this. Okay, now we switch and we to that point. So there's no, there's, it's not a case of the Venn diagram matching up. The Venn diagram was matched, this, the objectives were met. What we're doing now is saying, okay, we got two new diagrams. How are we gonna get that here? And if that means, okay, we, you know, even Mr. Er, uh, Mr. Gillis said, yeah, you can paint lines. It may not be the best option, but you can do it. Okay, that, if, if it's, if, if, but we can do that. And we did it with our, because the council today a few years ago said, we want walkability. That was the term, walkability. All the roads that we put in place have a, a whole meter of shoulder paved with the, with the gravel and the, 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 the rumble strips. That was the demand of the residents and the, the priorities of council of the day. That's how we, we constructed everything, and that's how we, the standard that we have. If we're going to change those standards, great. I'll, I'll spend as much money as you want. Council has to be prepared to recognize that it's going to double the cost of any road construction. If you're prepared to spend that, so be it. If we're prepared to say, okay, we're going to take baby steps and we're going to um, go to a rural standard or a suburban standard for shared roadways, which is, yes, it's, it's a shared road system. 
there's a dotted line for bicycles, it's more pavement markings with signage that people have to be aware that there are bicycles on the road. That is done in Europe. You, you know, the roads in Europe, if you've been there, they're no wider, narrower than what we have here. And there's bicycles, bicycles all over the place. They coexist. So what you have to do is you have to transition from a car-centric community to a coexisting community. And, and th that's a transition. You're not going to go from a car-centric community to a dedicated bicycle lane community. It's just not effective and efficient. It's not economical. You're not, it's not going to happen. And as, as, as your professional staff, I would not be able to recommend to you in good conscience, hey, let's go to dedicated bike lanes. Never going to happen. Um, uh, and so be that. I may be cutting my career short, but so be it. However, there are millions of examples out there of ways that we can coexist and, and do that transition. If the time comes that we're the Hampton Road, for example, designate a highway, we want to build a whole extra lane, we've got to partner with the DTI. If we can convince DTI to throw an extra half million dollars on that when we do that road upgrade and we're willing to match it, there we leverage our dollars. If the federal government comes through the gas tax and says, yes, bicycle lanes are the thing of the future and we want to help your community do it, I'm all on board, let's spend that money, right? But we have to be realistic on what we have on the ground now, literally and figuratively, to be able to what we can expect to do in the future. The, and, and in all due respect to, to, to the people that have been presenting, we'll get that from no matter what the vested interest group is going to come before council, is going to be, <clears throat> I want zero snow on the ground when you pay. So put, uh, you know, in Europe they've got uh, loops, heated loops, geothermal loops. We should have that in the town of Guspam says That's ultimate. Well, okay, we can do that. But what's going to cost? So we have to take those, those requests with a grain of salt. And as, as, just, as your staff, that's what we do. We say, if we could, if we could afford it, 100%. Do you think we, we don't see value in it? Not, by no stretch of the imagination. If we could say, that's excellent. We want to do that. We're, we, we're going to make that recommendation. But we'd look like fools coming before you and say, oh, yeah, and by the way, your street capital, instead of being $2.2 million this year, is going to be $6 million? <sighs> Thank you. Bye. I'm not here. So we have to be able to transition appropriately. And if that transition from a, from a street perspective is, okay, yes, we're do, doing the Means Cove Road, for example, this year. It's gonna have 1.5 meters of, of asphalt for a, a designated walking lane. We take the 100 grand from, from the finance committee and say, let's add another meter into that. How much will that give us? What does that mean we can do with bicycles? Okay, we'll have one lane walking, one lane dedicated bicycle, They'll, or maybe it'll be a shared walking bicycle, but it'll be wider. But it also have big green, elongated bicycles with signs that show cars showing people you know, yielding for bicycles. That's the transition. So you know, I, I don't mean to, to sort of spout off on that side of things, but that's the approach that we have to take from a staff perspective. And even going so far as to say, we have to also recognize what type of people are, are cycling. Is it a recreational cycle? Is it a person that says, I'm going to take my bike to go from point A to point B? Or is it the yellow jacket with the Tour de France and they're just, all they want is a big circle, a smooth circle. Who's using it? So all those things have to come into play when you look at your cycling network. Thank you, Councillor Bigger. Next in queue, we have Deputy Mayor Schreier. Thank you, Mr. Loger. Great presentation. So uh, one question that I um, want to ask you is regarding the price of gas and how that's going to affect our asphalt and affect our, our obviously, our, our, our vehicles. If you've built some projections in there or... Yeah, generally what we do is we, our fuel projections are built with a slight increase from year to year. Um, what we look at is the trends and um, we, even, even the industry is saying that this 150 plus is, is might be short lived, you know, and you'll, you'll see that, that decline again. But there is an increase in, in, in our operating for, for fuel. And what we also are looking at is <clears throat> alternative fuels. So, so we've got three electric vehicles in the engineering fleet. We had a six, uh, three vehicle trial with propane for fuels. So we're looking at ways to bring those down, the cost, the fuel cost down. Ultimately, that's gonna be a, a component that um, would come into play with the uh, fleet assessment study that we're proposing under general government. Um, and, and I was gonna to touch on that on our asset management side of things when we do that. But the fleet assessment is going to do that as well. Is is are we right sized? Are we looking? Are, are we lo looking at the proper fuel consumption? Do we have alternative fuels in place? Things of that nature. But from a from a vehicle perspective, we've got a slight um, a budget uh, uh, for that. From an asphalt perspective, it's a whole different fuel 
because it's not the same as your pump at your pumps that they use for the for yeah. the fuel. It's it's the, it's, the, it's the crude boil, crude price of a barrel of oil that's going to affect it more than the fuel pump costs will. will. And what we've seen is a lot of the contractors will uh, look at alternative ways to to to, to affect the ton per ton price. It's, it's, that's just one component of it. Is the is the oil side of things? They look at other things as their application, their staffing, their equipment, the whole nine yards. So, so we if you, if, you, if you look at even the trends that we had a few years ago, there that when the fuel prices were relatively high, we still managed to keep the the a reasonable perspective on the capital for for. Asphalt. So, oh, thank you. I'm not concerned that it's going to be a significant impact. It'll have some, but I don't it think it'll be significant. I just have a few more. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, as far as um, traffic calming, um, has there been any thought into doing um, a community awareness program as well as maybe actual? I actually had sent the mayor a picture of a traffic calming, just what you spoke of in New saw in Quebec or Ottawa, and I said, well, if that doesn't get the, the message across, I don't know what else could, a picture of a child in the middle of a road, like... <clears throat> Squished. But, um, but so I thought, you know, maybe, maybe should we be looking at a different approach to traffic calming as far as awareness, publication, um, partnering with the police, doing some type of public awareness just your thoughts on that we have a traffic calming policy that has three three levels enforcement education and then and then um, actual physical measures so the education there in our traffic calming policy there's a there's an education public awareness component and what we're seeing is that people don't care they skip right over they, they, they want to take the easy path and that means stop everybody they I, I think I've said it before at council I'll drive through a subdivision at 30 kilometers an hour and the people are on my behind in, the, in a town crested vehicle, on my back, trying to get by me. And they and they've turned from two houses down in their subdivision, and they want to get by me. Um, just the education programs, things like a pace car in the subdivisions, you can have neighbors who say that they're going to be take the pledge to be a pace car. They will no, they will not in a subdivision drive higher than the post limit or thirty or whatever it is. Um, they become targets for the neighbors. Um, we've had. Uh, 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 communities, we had even, uh, I'm not sure if it may have been Councillor Locke, we had residents who were spokespeople for their subdivision. because And when they're trying to communicate the message from the town to the residents, they get picked, then they don't want to volunteer to be the spokesperson anymore. So it's, it, it, you're 100% you're correct. The appropriate steps in our traffic calming policy start with education, then enforcement, then the physical measures. But they all want to go strictly to the easy things, the physical measures. And that's the challenge. You're you're 100 right. That's the challenge. Is how do we get it back to that physical that, that education component? Yeah. So we could have that uh, conversation oh. with the police and yeah, okay. Um, and my last one is um, I liked your comments on the gondola point. Or um, what do you call it? Uh, you call it a corridor. Analysis. Corridor. Um, you know it doesn't make sense. And I've explained this to people before. With the uh, I think this um, the water wastewater. Um, project is something like five million dollars by the time of completion so it doesn't make sense to rip up a road before we're completed our wastewater or even doing um, it in phases so that we they're digging it up while you're building the road right? yeah exactly so um i didn't i wasn't aware that you had done that before on the gondola point uh, the boulevard, boulevard yeah. um so on that the, the gondola point boulevard when you did that it take it, it would be a little bit different because this one would be on the water, right? So the, the the river only runs one way. We can't change the bends in the river and how the river moves. So um, I think, would there be someone besides just residential um, people being consulted on oh, this? Yeah, would definitely, you? Okay. definitely. Because because of the, you know, your, your comments a few council meetings ago about a scenic destination. Um, because of uh, the representation that we had from the cyclists, for example, or from the the director of community services AT group, those are all those are all viable components of that network that you want to take into account when you design that roadway. It is a main thoroughfare for that area. It's, we we want to get so many main thoroughfares, and as the the point road is that one that gets us right from the ferry to the Rossi boundary and beyond. So um, you know we we are taking all kinds of heat. We take heat regularly. Oh, the, the sidewalk ends at Rossi boundary. Blah blah blah. Okay, but I can live with that. But if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Schreier. Did you have any more? Um, 
No, I just wanted to comment on active transportation and um, thank you for your thoughts on that. I know um, it's like anything, things start to progress and it's uh, easier to sort of pick the low lying fruit first, uh, things that we can do easily and quickly. And as it gets, you get into the process more and more, it gets more and more difficult to, or more challenging to get everything done. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Shire. Moving next in queue is Councillor Miller. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, uh, a, a couple questions I'll just lead off the Deputy Mayor's for the Gondola, Bo Gondola, Gondola Boulevard. Um, how much would is this incremental? And why I say that is you would have to do a study anyways, right, to do all this stuff. Um, because if, if regardless if we're calling it scenic or doing whatever, you would do a study, I'm guessing, to find out where to put the sewers, where to put the manholes, things like that. So there, there will be a base uh, uh, design for sewer infrastructure, uh, sewer lines, a force main, uh, where the pump station. They'll be they're they're pretty much isolated, and that they have to be either directly adjacent to because we have so much land. But everything else, infrastructure wise, yes, will be design associated with that. So we would know the limits of what, how much of the road we would have to dig up. Yeah. Um, even as part of the package, we are looking at because we have three lift stations. There's one in the middle that potentially could be eliminated, but it means we didn't have to dig real deep to get to get gravity. And we have to balance that project as well. And if that happens, all of a sudden you're, di you're digging up, instead of a lane, you're digging up the whole road. Yeah. And, and the problem is we're digging up deep enough that you might end be in the river. So those, that's a constraint that we have. Mm -hmm. But you're correct. We have some preliminary infrastructure design outside of anything we do with AT on the Gondola Point Road. So, so I guess my question would, would be, of this 100,000, how much would we, I mean, part of it's for scenic route and things like that, but how much would we spend regardless? Um, so uh, what I'm, trying to, I'm trying to figure out, this isn't like 100,000 extra, because we would have had to spend some anyways. This is, this is the, the, the design and public input and phasing and things of that nature. So, so the, what would happen is they would, um, pro a lot of the work is to get that um, streetscape design in place. So they wouldn't be designing the infrastructure. They would be strictly designing the streetscape. So what we would be doing is we, we would be saying, yeah. we'd be saying, here's what we're going to be putting in the ground for sewer. You design the, the, the road surface. So, so it, it is all would be spent. It's not, it's not a redundant type of uh, investment. The hundred grand that we're proposing is, is primarily for the street top. All the other design is the stuff under the ground, and it still has to be done, correct? But it, we wouldn't reduce our $100,000 because we're doing something under the ground. And, and maybe I'm not at, uh, hearing right, but we would have to spend some of this money anyways, to a degree, or would we? We would have to spend some of the money anyway if after we dig up the road to put the road back in as is, we would be spending more if we wanted to design it to a different standard. So yeah. we're... So, do you, do you have a ballpark of the hundred grand? It depends, it depends on, the, on the size of each okay. specific project. The road design component of each, generally on a one point seven million dollar wastewater pump station, the, the the street component is usually in that thirty forty thousand dollar range. Um, a couple of other quick ones. Um, um, the intersection. Are we paying for all of that? I'm just asking because I know the actual. This um, one. Yes, sorry, the, yes. Inter the, the intersection for the flashing, because yeah. um, three of the four posts are in Quispam and one is in Rossi. Actually, all four posts are in Quispam. Oh, are they? Okay, then. I thought one was in Rossi. Okay, so, no. yeah, that make, makes sense. Ignore the rest of that question. Um, flashing signs, just uh, for those that know, we actually did $30,000 last year. We increased it, so yep. that may be, may be a discussion. Uh, the $100,000 sidewalks, that was me that pushed that. Um, just, it, and I was thinking just leave it maybe as an option because, and I'm going to put an option three or four uh, with Mr. Loge is Princeton Avenue. For those that know the kids that walk to school in Lakefield, Queensbury, that's a whole different discussion, but you have to drive up Princeton, which is a narrower street than Queensbury. And for those that ever have kids or had to drive up there, when you're driving up in the winter, you're driving into the sun, you can't see anything and the roads are plowed. You can barely get through there. So my thought would be having even a walking trail, a, a paved one, just on the other side, but that would have to, that would be a, a much greater cost because you'd have to fill in all the culverts. So that would be maybe another option. Um, and also when you talk about extending, if you go up Minstrel, if you go up that where the speed bumps are, the sidewalks stop halfway through. And you know, that's still one of the busiest roads and that's also a narrower street because 
when, when they built that. Um, uh, the a couple of real quick questions for you, Mr. Loger. Bradley Lake Road, I see the final phase is now in 2025. Is that, the, the road's good enough to last till that long? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we look at the road base, but we also look at traffic volume and, and occupancy. There's no homes on that last stretch. So we're, it's, it's, if you drive it, it's on that last stretch, it goes out to the gravel pits, and so the demand is not there. So we felt that it would be appropriate to push it out. And, if, if, and as, as you recognize with all of our capital programs, we will do it. We reassess, so the, the list that you see for the future next year may be different than what's presented now, because as, a, as I touched on a little earlier, we still have 50% of our street ratings that are older than 2019. So we, as we review them, it may change what we have in front of us. Two real last quick ones. Uh, one is about painting of the roads. Yes. Um, we've had this discussion, it came up at our last council meeting. Uh, two things. So if we were to add paint, because there's a cost, we get the manpower, we get the paint. Uh, I'm not saying it's a big cost because we've got the machines now. Um, you know, Vincent Road, you could have the, if they painted the lines just the same as Rossi, all the way down Vincent Road would be question number one. But also number two, and it came up at our last council meeting, is, you know, I think our roads are wide enough, but is there, if, is it possible when we repaint some of the roads that you, we narrow the road a little bit and widen out the shoulder? That's just kind of uh, as, I, as I said earlier, yeah, that's that's definitely a possibility. I would hesitate to do it just for the sake of saying we want to do it for a bike lane. It would, uh, what, I, what we're proposing to do is use that, go through that process as part of the master transportation plan. That's that part B, that's what we're doing this, this year, or we're proposed to do this coming year. Because what we would then do is establish a hierarchy, a street hierarchy, and it does a couple of things. Your hierarchy then sets a level of service from many things from a roadway width to the speed limit that's there, um, whether it has a walking lane, a bike lane, and if you have a street hierarchy set in place, then you can apply that to all of the network in the, t in the community, right? So now you can say, well, is it fair to think that we would take Kensington or Princeton or West, you know, Winchester, and it, it needs a paved road, a bike lane, and a walking lane when there's 10 cars a day on that thing? No, so that's a hierarchy decision or a, or a court the balsam court or any you know, little courts. No, so we could go down to a narrow uh, asphalt width. But we say, all right, what is what do we consider a collector road? The Hampton Road, the Vincent Road, the Gondola Point Road. We think that warrants a dedicated bike lane or a specific lane for walking, whatever it is. You set that priority now under the plan, and when the time comes, from a staff perspective, we know five years down the road, I have to plan for the Gondola Point Road to be built to this standard that was agreed upon. Now, instead of saying, well, you coulda, shoulda, woulda, well, I know, well, this is a standard we want to build to. This is where it's going to be. So that's why we think that for, for painting lines for the sake of bike access, yes, it can be accommodated, but it should be done in an appropriate location. Do it at the right location at the right time. And we feel that time is after we have the discussion with the transportation master plan. Because council as a whole, and your input into the plan, may decide, you know what? I don't like riding a bike up a hill. I think we should focus on walking or pogo sticks or whatever it is. We need a pogo stick lane. Off you go. Thank you. And I think part of, for me, is the bike lane is one thing, but I've never seen one person drive up the Mar Road yet, and I've driven that many times, and they've got bike lanes. But it's, and I think it also narrows the speed, and it, it, for people that are walking, it makes it safer where we don't have sidewalks. But, but it also goes to the point about... Yes, we had two folks here from one community, from our community, one from another community, saying that it's important. But beyond that, and, and Director of Community Services can tell, correct me if I'm wrong, we haven't really had a lot of input on bike lanes in the town of Chris Pam Sis. Demands. You know, yes, you're going to have people come in and say, I represent so many people. However, the demand is there. You, you, I'm sure you get more demands for people speeding than you do for people for bike lanes. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> uh, my la very last question, I'm sorry. Uh, it's... Um, it, it, and this is for the, the newer people in council. Historically, we've broken down whether it was a Pettengill Road or the Quispam Road into multiple phases, and which is fine. Um, but sometimes it's taken three or four years. My question is, is there any savings if we added in Means Cove, if we went all the way to Collingwood versus stopping full year? I know you said at the end, we'll see what we're at, but if we put a bid in to go the whole way, um, is there any savings as far as prep time and things like that? It's just, just so that we could get it done in three years versus four is kind of my there, 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 there's some savings, as I said earlier in the presentation, a lot of it's gonna boil down to what is the unit price for asphalt at the time and, and what how they bid the particular project. If it was a road that was just seal and you just go over and you 
run the, the, the asphalt spreader and you just go, you could, you could go forever in a day, like you just lay down a river and a pavement. But if you actually have to go ahead of it and say, okay, I've got to pulverize the road, dig it all out, replace the gravels, those unit costs are going to dictate how economical it is to, to decide if you go beyond that. Um, the Hammond River and the Brady Lake last year are prime examples where we were able to take advantage and leverage the unit price on the asphalt because it was limited road-based work, but we could plow a lot of asphalt down. And that made a big difference right there. So what we're hoping to see on the Means Cove Road is the front end from the arterial probably up to probably up to the country view of the first is there's a reasonable base in there and we're hoping that we can see uh, that reflected in the rest of the tender price. The other thing that we would take into account is um, even to build on your most your last statement if we go in and we say we, we build the road to uh, uh, one meter wide we add a say we add another meter and a half for a bike lane but the council says no that's not what we do all of a sudden we've we've can, we've either done it and we're not going to do it for the rest of the way or we didn't do it and we should do it for the rest of the way you know it's that conundrum that you you want, don't want to get too far ahead of yourself and i think you and i spoke a little bit before the meeting is you go on the means cove road and you go so far and all of a sudden the the widths that are like this you get to the corner by the chamberlain and and past the uh, 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 subdivision there and the road goes like this, and that's that sharp corner. So you don't have the width to work with anymore. And right away, all of a sudden, you're digging into the bank to create a width. So, thank you, Councillor Miller. Going next in queue, and we will go for. Uh, we'll see how many more questions we have first. Uh, Councillor Luck, please. Thank you, Your Worship. <laughs> Um, first, I do want to give kudos to the, the uh, director and the staff of the engineering works department because, uh, you know, again, I thought the asset management plan was very forward thinking. And again, I think it's wonderful as a town, we actually have that to kind of guide some of the things because there's lots of upkeep. So it's nice that we have that. Um, as well as the exceptional job you're doing with the um, explosion of building permits. I'm a recipient and I know that there's certain time frames that you have to get out and do things so you know it doesn't affect the, uh, the building. So I'm kudos because I know that that can't be easy with such an explosion of a uh, building. Um, I also appreciate your openness to looking at um, you know, looking at things differently and you know listening to the needs of the community as we grow and change. So I have Two questions. One is about the Gondola Point connect, uh, corridor analysis. I think Councillor Miller was trying to get to it, and I, I was kind of, I'm still a little confused because I think 100 grand seems like a lot. Yep. When you have pointed out that we have a river on one side of us, we have houses that are really close to, like, we only have so much space. Like, even if we wanted to put in the best bike lanes, the best side, we can't, we physically, unless we start expropriating people's land, which I'm assuming as a town we don't want to do. <laughs> okay. So I guess I'm just wondering, because we are very limited on a dead end street, um, even though it does connect us to Rosse, I'm just wondering if, you know, do we need that much money to explore something that we have, we don't have infinite opportunities there. Like it's kind of like, you know, we can maybe get an extra meter in that's going to maybe improve walkability and bike safety a little bit and put some pavement down. Like I just don't know if a hundred grand is going to provide us with anything because we're going to come up with great ideas that we can't accomplish anyway. Um, to, and, and, and I don't don't mean to take the, the negative stance to your, but it's, the, it's we have infinite possibilities. It's not finite, and, and that it is not a dead end street. It actually it is a major collector in the community. It goes the only dead end part, and is is, is from uh, the Merritt Hill to the ferry. Everything else is interconnected to the community. So so that interconnectivity is what we want to base all of the growth on, and to even to build on on, on the presentations that have been made in the past. If and and as the community services uh, said to us. If we use the Gondola Point Road as a at the main, then you have all the spurs that go off of it. So what this designs that we're proposing is not just the Point Road itself; is what comes off of that. So if we say we want to be able to make a scenic route, and we're going to go through that scenic route, and we need a pull off, how does that design? So that part of those costs are incorporated there. If we want to, if we say we we have a finite level of of width, okay, there's a finite width, but there's going to be different ways to approach that. It's going to be. Is it going to be dedicated? Is it going to be separated? Uh, do we negotiate with the, the property owners? We still have a 66-foot right-of-way through there. And, and really all it means is that, um, yes, the properties are encroaching, but it means that if we go in, we may be terracing a, a, a walkway in, in a certain area. It just means that we're looking at the costs to do this. So we, we don't want to make an assumption that all of a sudden we're restricted to that, that narrow width. 
what we want to do is say, what is there on the ground and what do we own, what do we control? If it happens to be 15 feet beyond the edge of a ditch, then how do we, how do we leverage that? Can we leverage it? Um, things of that nature. So, so it's not just the, um, the, uh, the, the active transportation component, it's all the infrastructure that goes with this. So you could, we all have seen it all over the world, you can put bike lanes, you can put walking lanes, pretty much any place if you want to pay the money. And I think that's the, that's the, the, the expansion of thinking that we want to have is, what do we want to see for this particular corridor? Is it going to be, hey, this is going to be as, as attractive as a QR trail is? You want to walk to Gondola Point Road. Holy smokes. You could get on the ferry, walk across, be a walker on the ferry, go across the Kingston Minster, come back. There you can walk all the way to Rossi. And you get to, and all Rossi has is that piddly sidewalk. You should see what Chris Pan has. They get bikes, they get walking lanes, they get whatever. So you, you take that concept and say, what do we want to be? And I think that, I think that study is where, what we want to be able to say is, what do we want to be? It's more than just the design. Yes, they will be taking some of the costs to do the designs of that, but it also takes us through that exercise of, here are the possibilities. Yes, there will be things that we can, yeah, this is what all we can do, but there'll be things that we th will go, gee, I never thought of that. That's, and that's, I think that's an appropriate way to look at that particular quarter. I think, I, I, I see that as one of the more enticing development opportunities from a town's perspective, from public access. Yes, the properties may be all be developed and there's no residential properties left, but the, from a town's perspective, it's our right of way. We can slow, is there a reason why people are driving that road 70 kilometers an hour? There's no reason they should be driving that road 70 kilometers an hour. Slow it down, go to the narrower lanes. There we've reclaimed some streets. But that all, that all is required to do that through that review process and that's the study. And that's generally, in the investigation that I've seen, that's generally the cost that you're gonna get for the preliminary work, some, some detailed design in advance. After that, you get into the construction and there's tendering and cost, but that's gonna get us a real good feel for what we wanna see on that particular location. Another question. Okay. Um, and just to build on that, so I think it's great that we have the openness and kind of visionary, you know, kind of approach where we want to kind of explore and figure out how we can continue to beautify. We're, our... we're, we're here, staff is here. The staff is never going to say no to something that council wants to have. What we're going to say is, hey, you, you, you want to do it, it's going to cost you this. Okay. But we're, I'm never going to say to you, I can't do that. So with that in mind, yeah. I do want to talk about a little bit, because respectfully, when I look at the active transportation plan, there are some pieces in there that we haven't accomplished. And they also did, back 11 years ago, already develop the hierarchy of connector roads and what they should look like. So to Councillor Councilor Miller's point, I guess I'd like to see some openness, because I do hear on a regular basis from more than just two residents that we definitely need to look at you know, active transportation. I guess the point is we we have to stop separating walkability from bikeability. Yep. Active transportation is those two things together. And I see we're doing a lot of fabulous things kind of piecemeal, but we still have to look at how do we get from point A to point B safely. 100%. Um, and I think the presentation the other day by Dr. or Mr. Gillis, like for example, Mians Cove Road, where we're going to potentially be paving it, I just don't want us to be here in another few years saying, ah, oh, I wish we would have you know, talked about it, because right now the proposal is four meters, four meters with a walking lane of 1.5. If we actually don't even expand that and we move those driving surfaces to three meters, we all of a sudden have a walk bike lane on each side of 1.5. Yeah, but, you, but you also have a three meter wide high volume corridor that people normally, because we, we got to look at this two ways. Mm -hmm. You take three meters wide and you have somebody that, I drove a 26 foot U-Haul with a 13-foot trailer up through, uh, through up to Ottawa last weekend. I was going through a construction zone that I had of six inches of clearance on both sides. Okay, So I put somebody in the Quispam Sis on a three-meter wide lane that's not used to driving it, and you have somebody on a bike that they think it's safe, and they get clipped. All of a sudden, we have to look at everything. 100%, definitely, we, we don't want to be doing something afterwards saying, oh, geez, we should have done that. That's why we're going through this process, because right now, as I said to Councillor Miller a little earlier, yeah, it's $545,000. You want us to put in a bike lane? Give me another $200,000. I'll do it. I've brought projects, and, and, and other members of staff have brought projects to the council, previous councils that said, here's what we can do. And council have said, that's a little bit too rich. Can you cut it back? Oh, we don't need a sidewalk there. Can you do it here? Or we need a sidewalk someplace else. I'm never going to say no to a project that you, if you count, convince the rest of the council members to say, yes, we need a bike lane on the Mines Cove Road built to five meters width, cut your lanes down to three, this, and they get, they have the opportunity to say, yeah, give the, give the town engineer another $400,000, $200,000. It will be built. 
please don't, please don't think that we don't want to accommodate the, the cyclists. I have to balance that demand with how much investment the town decides to give to this department to put the capital program in place. That, and, that, and that's the long and the short of it. Right. The, the, the idea of doing something in advance of not knowing what the impacts are going to be and only doing a small section of it really is, is going to be counterproductive. It's, it's, not going to come, it's not going to meet the objective if we say, oh, okay, all of a sudden we're going to put, uh, we haven't looked at it, but we're going to put a three-meter lane on the Means Cove Road. And the police come to us and say, do you know how many people are, getting, are reporting near misses on the bike? Because this guy, he, he always used to be able to drive that thing 70 miles an hour, 70 kilometers an hour. Now he's, he thinks he, it should be 40, but he still thinks he has to drive at 70, and he's clipping bikes. That's the last thing I want to have come back before you as council members is say, did, did you think about really what you're doing? But if we have a, a, of a whole program, take the hierarchy that the AT plan has proposed, refine it with the current strategic vision of council, and say, yes, we're going to go through this whole area, we're going to make this, but combine it with an education program. Town's going to be bicycle, we're, we're, we're going to take away the blurred line between walkability and bikeability. We're going to be committing to this. Here's what we're going to do. You'll see white lines on the Means Cove Road. It's three meters wide. You better adjust your speed. There's going to be signs for that. It's planned the whole way, whether it's phased all at once or whether it's over a couple of years. You have to be able to, the residents of the community, as, as, as well-intentioned as they are, they have one thing in mind. I go from work to my house. How fast can I get there to get the kids to the hockey game and back? And, and we've all heard it, that the worst people speeding or paying attention or not, they're on their phone, whatever, in the subdivision, gee, I, I would push my stroller and I almost get clipped by the little old lady or, or young kid that lives down the road. The residents themselves have to see this as a, as, and, and we have to be able to lead them by the, by the hand. And we have to do that properly and planned. And I, and, I, and I really do think that we can't just say we're gonna do this, all right, for this stretch, let's give them a, the whole layout to take it. Uh, and I, you know, I may be wrong, I may be proven wrong, and when I'm dead and gone, people go, who was that frigga that was the engineer back in 30 years in the town of Quispam? So be it. But I think anything that I've seen from, from the industry, from my experience and from what I've seen from other communities, the only effective programs are ones that are properly planned, communicated, constructed, feedback, and follow through that way. Okay, so to my point is with Means Cove, which was identified 11 years ago in the Master Transportation Plan as a collector road, or a, I may, I'm not sure if that's the right terminology. I guess that's my worry is that if we would have done, I guess I just don't want to be here in 10 more years still talking about is there a way to slower speeds, which it sounds like the evidence is suggesting more narrow roadways, and still improving active transportation because we don't, I mean, in reality, we can't afford sidewalks. There's a lot of upkeep to them. So if we're looking at, you know, getting people to be able to safely push a stroller or to walk or to bike or to roll or however they want on the side of the road, because that's a reality in a more rural community, how are we going to do that if we kind of keep pushing it off? Like, I'm just wondering, how are we going to build this in today that we're not going to run out and paint every street with lines and we're not, but we need to have that as part of our thinking moving forward. So with Means Cove, which is costing a half million dollars or close to it to pave that small section, and we have a certain amount of width, I, I guess it's just that like once things are done, it's a lot harder to go back. Like Model Farm Road has these great shoulders that are full of rock, which doesn't help anybody in terms of active transportation because they're hard to walk on and it's hard, they're almost impossible to bike on. So I'm just wondering how can we, start thinking about that because it's not just bikes, it's also walkability. Yep. And, and how we talk, how we thought thinking about it is, is we staff get direction from council that says, think about it. We think about it. We come to you with a budget that then you approve all the previous examples that we've had of, of and I can only speak to my street capital program. If I come to a street capital program and council of the day, back in the day said, you got a million dollars. And I came to say, well, I spent that whole million dollars on the Means Cove Road. They're gonna, the, anytime that that's happened, they've gone, well, I had so-and-so call me up and I, he wants this street paved. I said so-and-so, so, -and -so, so, so it's, we're, we're doing that dance, we're doing that happy balance. So the commitments that we make, whether it's a strategic exercise, whether it's a transportation master plan exercise, is making that commitment. Council has, has demonstrated that leadership currently with this asset management plan. They've committed to it, they've given staff direction to say, this is what you want, we want you to follow. Okay, so I think the same thing has to occur. The active transportation plan from 10 years ago, 
Council, council, quite frankly, council went, oh, that's great, yeah, Dana, just do what you can. And, 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 but they didn't say, Dana, this says we have to make this a, 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 a collector road. And, and, or to me, take, take this back 10 years ago, take a million dollars, make that a collector road, there you go. That, you know, and, and, but that's the importance, that's the role that, that council plays. And as I said before, I'm never going to say no to a project that you want. I 100%, I agree. If, if, I could, if I could start today with the Means Cove Road, but I know that the Means Cove Road is going to be, to do that, even to the Collingwood area or whatever, it's going to be about $750,000, dollars $800,000. Council says to me today, start it, ha, it's done. About like Councillor Miller's point about like Vincent Road. So basically, you know, you get to the point of the Rossi border where it's the same width, and the bike lanes just end. And, and like again, I guess I'm just wondering if there's, that's if there's a, that's, ways. That's, if, as a if that's a paintability thing, for sure. That's that's if if this community says that's that's the the program we want to have, we also have to be prepared for the residents say that's not what we asked for. Well, that's what we can afford, and that's a lot of things that we've said in the past. Mm -hmm. You may have asked for this, but this is what we can afford. We can afford repainted widths. And it will slow it down. Right. Again, we go back to the police and say, if we do this, what, what trouble are you having? Is only this wide, should be this wide. We're not meeting a tax standard for a bike lane width. All those things. What are those liabilities that we're, we're exposed to? Um, even Mr. Gillis' president, he said, you know, this is not great. You may not meet standard, but at least you'll have this. We also have to be step back and say, are we accepting that risk? Are we accepting that liability? Should we build it a certain way? So uh, from a... We want to give you the best information on which to make that decision. That's all, that's all, all we're really trying to do, really, when you get right down to it. Okay. Well, I thank you. I appreciate all that insight. I'll just leave it with yeah. it. I, I understand 100% what you're saying, right. and I agree. Like I said, the yeah. last thing I'm going to say is, 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 no, we don't want to do this. Yeah. No, and I guess we hear a lot about speeding. Yeah. And then all this new literature is coming out saying narrow row widths help with that because it slows it down. So I just look at this as maybe a synergy of us looking, again, a bit broader and being kind of forward thinking. And then also, you know, making sure we have that potentially in our, our um, expenses that if we decide that we want to maybe try this or pilot this on a certain road, then do we have the, the money to put those paint lines in? So yeah. that's... Yeah, that's and, and uh, I agree. And, and the things that we should remember is, and, and I'll use the, the Queensbury part as an example. People said, we want the humps. Try this. So we try them. Oh, we hate the humps. We want this. We'll try the diversions. Well, we, we hate that. So, so, so we, yes, we would try these things, but it's, it's a question of then, what's to, to what result? You can't please 100% of the people 100% of the time, and that's what we're trying to balance. It's, it, it's, it's yeah. I'm, I'm surprised I have as much hair as I do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Luck. And we have Councillor Olson next. Thank you, Worship. Uh, thanks, Gary, for your updated information there. A um, couple of things. I guess I, uh, I think every time we talk about roads and that, I harp on this phasing that takes four or five road years to complete a thing. I was, I was ecstatic when I saw the work done on Hammond River Road. You and me both. I just kept driving and driving and driving, and it was asphalt all the way. Yep. And uh, and I would say, you know, uh, this didn't take five years to do or three years to do. I was really, I was very, very pleased. I think, well, why wouldn't you be? You know, I mean, it was perfect. Um, when, I, when we look at Meenan's Cove Road, and I compare that to Gondola Boulevard that, uh, you know, we took on in, in phases, and Gondola and the Meenan's Cove Road now, we're starting in 2022 and 2023 and uh, spending uh, 1.2 million there or no no we no we skip 24 we go to 25 then we've uh, we've uh, invested 1.2 million and that's that's only going to uh, Bunnell. that's correct Bunnell. is that halfway I, I I'm Bunnell is the sharp corner it's, it's just after Bunnell, that's when you get into the really wonky widths, like the steep banks and by Lawson's farm. By there. Lawson. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I know where you're at now. So, 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 uh, and it all goes to um, um, the, the phasing goes to fitting the allocated budget that we have and spreading around again. Uh, from and, and, and I, I'm a, I won't say a creature I have, but I'm I, I, at, at the desire of council, if, if they say this is what we want you to do, again, council says 
pave all of Amiens Cove Road and get it done in one year and, and incorporate you know the extra widths for bike lane, we can come back to you with an estimate and say this is going to be one point seven million dollars. Then it goes back to you as as council members decide: do we want to borrow that or do we want to not make it a priority or change it or whatever? So. Um, if the approach, the approach is yours to manage, essentially. As I said, I, I, we make a suggestion. If you say I, we would like the whole street paved, as was done last year for the Ham River Road and Bradley Lake, pave more. Um, definitely, you're 100% you're right. It, you, there's a sense of accomplishment. It's done, you're out of the area, the whole goes. And that's, that's what you see when you see the subdivisions. We do the subdivisions, the subdivisions are all done. That's what you feel when you go into the subdivision. They've got four streets and they're all done in that same year. You're done, you get out of there. You don't, you're not back there for another 20 years. I understand that philosophy of uh, of doing an area, uh, you know, in, con in concentration, to take advantage of having your equipment there, right, right there, and the same thing is going to happen on Gondola Point, uh, Gondola Point Road, is that uh, we're going from uh, starting in twenty three, go to twenty six, and uh, we're only at phase four, yeah. which uh, is complete. And, and the Gondola Point Road, I, we pr I pr propose it that way mainly because we don't know what's going to come out of the recommendations mm -hmm. and um, to, to almost to serve as a placeholder, to, ag to acknowledge that, th that generally we think that's what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. So as, as, as with any of these things, these are the, these are the placeholders. To, so we need this amount of money. Where, it, where it's slotted, it's irrelevant. The only relevant year, is, as our treasurer will tell you, is the current year. Year two, three, four, and five in our five-year plan, that's... That's like this. That's like where do we want to put it? Where do we want to sit it? So yeah. the relevance for it is is the value mm -hmm. that if we want to take it forward and, and consolidate it into mm -hmm. into less phases, it gives us an idea of what that cost is. So that's and that's why it's spread out that way. But it's but it, it is it can be incorporated into any lengths that we reduced need. amount. Yeah. Uh, have you have you considered? I know we've talked at uh, one point in time. I can't remember when exactly. About, uh, instead of having that dead end at the uh, at the uh, uh, ferry, about uh, putting a one way exit onto the arterial, have um, you looked at that at all? We made the request to DTI to have them look at it. Um, yeah. They have some concerns with regards to the separation from the ferry and the exits and mm -hmm. the, the the lanes right next to the ferry itself. Mm -hmm. um, it might be a little. It's, it's multi-jurisdictional, so they would have more impact than we would. For us to do it, it would probably be a fifty, sixty thousand dollar exercise creating a turning lane. For mm -hmm. them, the headache of having unanticipated traffic coming into the side, you know, coming at the side of their 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 traffic coming off the ferry, is, might be more of a headache. So, so it would it would one hundred percent be they give us permission to do it. But we have looked at it, and it can be accommodated. We might take a little bit of the parking area from the beach to do it. And there's some rock there that might uh, increase the cost, but it, 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 if all else being equal, it, it would be a, in that sixty, seventy thousand dollars range to do it. Would be, a, it would be another uh, means of egress out of that area. Yeah, the, the presentation that was made uh, back oh. a couple of years ago, the fellow that was here, um, that, and those those are all valid points. And yes, it could be done. Um, just one it, way. It, yeah, just one, one way, oh. a lane, a slip lane to go on. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 feasible. It's all boils down to if DTI wants to do it, and DTI has some strange rules when it comes to access on there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Parkside, uh, Parkside uh, Road, Phase Three entrance to Gwen, two hundred and fifty-five thousand. Um, is that the end of what is planned there, or phase? That's Phase Three. Is that's the that's the that's the last section that's meeting the last. Pave we did wasn't front. around the corner. So th this takes us from the sharp corner right out to the arterial. Okay, all right. The uh, you talk about improving or enhancing the uh, traffic control of Pettingill. Yes. And the Hampton Road. Um, I think that's that's a great move. I'd also uh, and I've mentioned to you before about uh, Donlan Drive. Yes. Uh, Ten thirty at night. Not a bit of traffic moving anywhere, and you're coming down the Hampton Road. You got to stop. For nothing, you know. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the controls are set there for Main Street Green. What that means is they the Main Street stays all the time and it only draws the call if you pull up to the side. Um, we've had discussions with the police on the approach that they want to have. They they can live with either one. Um, what we were waiting to see was um, the age of that because that's the next controller to be re, to to be adjusted. And if we incorporate a, a all-way flash after ten o'clock, similar to what you see at the Vincent Road type of thing. 
that's uh, that's addressing reality. Yeah. Uh, because I mean, the, the malls are shut down. Everything's shut down. I mean, I've done it a dozen times. What well, we all have, I think, coming down the Hampton Road, and all of a sudden we come to a red light. Yep. And there's nothing moving on either side of us. We're sitting there in the middle of the night, waiting for this yep. to change. The the age of the controller is one that um, it needs some updates. On, that's on your radar. It's, it's on. It's on the. It's it's. it's the, the controller itself is level of service, is still meeting level of service, like the, the de delays for people waiting because of that, that turn. Um, the, the volume, traffic volumes are less, and that's what ranked the Pettingill intersection a little higher for control uh, upgrades over the Donlin. But the Donlin, I believe, is the, is the next one that would be either next year or the year after that we're looking at. The um, um, sidewalks, I've, I've talked about sidewalks, I think, every, every, every year. meeting. And uh, I, I would just like to see us uh, come up with a plan. You know, I, I think I think uh, sort of what uh, has has drawn my attention is the, the number of school kids walking around Princeton and uh, and uh, Queensbury and the uh, the elementary school now the new new elementary school uh, new elementary yeah middle middle uh, middle, middle school, school. Middle? yeah. And uh, but there's uh, snow, Saunders. Is that not snow, but uh, Saunders, Chris Saunders, Chris Saunders, that elementary, it's elementary, yeah. But I mean, there's a concentration of kids walking in that busy subdivision with no sidewalks. And you talk about snow and plowing and all that stuff. And we every year we get letters from residents, and uh, and I'd just like to see us do something there. I mean, it was a great breakthrough when we did uh, Southwood. You know, and we had public sessions and we had meetings here and, and people come in and said, yeah, we kind of like that design and that's what we put in. But uh, uh, I, I think that I think that we've got to uh, we've, we've got to identify a strategy and a time frame on, on putting putting uh, phasing in sidewalks so that people can see it. I mean, uh, people love to see their tax rate change and all that stuff, but they also will pay to see improvements into their daily activity within our community. By that, I mean walking and safety of the kids and all that stuff. So I'd, uh, I'm a big supporter of sidewalks, and I think it's something that we should be phasing in on an annual basis in our budgets and have, having a program that we can say we're going from here to here to here to here, just a phased-in thing that we can say to the people, well, it's not going to happen this year, but the next year we're going from here to there, and it's already planned, it's going to be budgeted. And, and then, if we want to uh, accelerate that, we can uh, we can find the money, you know. I mean, in, in the budget process, it's, it's, it, we use the same approach on the Hampton Road when we built the sidewalks on the Hampton Road. Then the philosophy back in the day with council was that we we needed to put the feeder sidewalks off the side, so we got the sidewalks at Clarewood and those type of things. So I think the similar thing is going to boil down to is is once you have that your core network, your core corridor, where do you spur off of it, building on the, the sort of the QR trail. The, the master transportation plan, one of the components of that master transportation plan, sidewalks are part of that transportation plan. So it may not have a, a, a defined plan, but it will probably, what we'll likely have is a template for decision making, decide, okay, what do we want to establish as a priorities? And then we can build off of that from a sidewalk priority document if, you, if we want. But uh, that is part of the, the master transportation plan is the sidewalk network and what should we do with it and how to grow it and things like that. I think uh, I think we have to recognize the anchors are our schools, in the concentrated area in this particular time frame, and including uh, the uh, Frankenbaum School, uh, you know. And we've got an opportunity to enhance down in that area too, and a lot of growth going on in that subdivision. Yep. And uh, but anyway, uh, I think I think that's that's about it uh, for me, Gary. But uh, thank you very much. Anytime. Thank you, Councillor Olson. And uh, thank you, Mr. Loger, for answering all of the questions that were presented to you. And uh, certainly um, one of the things that I see, and I'll just pass the chair to uh, the deputy mayor, uh, often we see people bringing their lawns down to the road's edge, which eats up the shoulder of the road. And that forces walkers, bikers, whomever, to actually walk on the road rather than on the shoulder because they don't want to ruin the, the lawn. And, I know that's an aspect of beautification of their property. So just 
bearing that in mind as well, that that's also uh, has been an issue in the past. And uh, to Councillor Olson's point, certainly the walkability in the school areas is, uh, is key. And certainly around an old established school such as Lakefield, as well as uh, Quispam Elementary and, uh, and Quispam Middle, uh, that's always a concern as well when, when children are walking either on the shoulder of a road or where the lawn has been pushed down to the, to, the, to meet the road. So thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, we will break for lunch and we will be back in our seats at 1.15. Thank you very much. Kathy, do we need a motion? Okay. But we don't need one. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll wipe it down when I'm done. I guess. Drinks.